What if you could use ChatGPT and Dolly to recreate TripAdvisor for just $53 in 15 hours? My guest today did just that, and he breaks it all down for us. He also created a new hotel brand with his daughter in just seven hours using MidJourney and ChatGPT. It's a whole new world, and it's generative. Lee Mellon, welcome to the VoiceBot Podcast. Really great to have you here. Thanks, Brett. Looking forward to it. Okay, so we've known each other for a while, but we haven't spent a lot of time together. I can think of like Voice Lunch and other places where we've been online. We've talked a little bit. Certainly a lot of interaction on LinkedIn and other places throughout the years working in the voice assistant space. Both of us are doing a lot more in the generative AI space as well. And you had something that I think was particularly interesting that popped up recently. So we just jumped right on this recording to talk about it. So pretty interesting AI generated chip advisor for $53. Lee, let's talk about that. That's a good place to start. What happened? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a bit of background. Uh, so me and my family um, in August, 2021 decided to go traveling around the world for a year. We ended up going for 18 months. Um, and now we don't live in England. We live in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Um, and during that travel, obviously we stayed, we stayed in like 55, 65 hotels, so many flights, so many countries. Um, and off the back of it, we were kind of reminiscing one night, me and my kids were having a conversation. We were talking about what our favorite hotel was, what do we enjoy, all these different activities we kind of uh, experienced. Um, and it kind of got us thinking, like, there is no trip advisor for families and for kids, you know, and it's very generic. It's not very personalized, which then kind of led us down this, which I'm sure we'll go into the, the weeds about it, but into this thing of can you, can you create these massive content sites that we now have known for years in the Web2 world do they still have some relevance now in the web AI world? Um, and uh, can you recreate it very quickly? And you know, the outcome of this was, uh, yeah, you can. Okay, so let's look at some of the top line numbers here. So you, so first of all, you think of this as a generative AI project, right? Yeah, of course. And so yeah, generative AI is. meets like traditional web technologies as well. Yeah, it's everything. Everything on there is generated. The images, the text, um, only the prompts, uh, and obviously there's the code behind to actually um, create the website. But I, I don't think we're that far away from the whole thing being completely uh, prompt engineered. Uh, the, the the main thing I think with it is that it was though awkward to set up, but then now you know I could create. TripAdvisor for hotels, for bars, for businesses, for the cities, for schools, you know, within a few hours. All right. So this is this is great. So we have some top line numbers up here right now. 237 cities, 2370 activities, so 10 per city, over 2,600 images. You actually pulled in 400 reviews. I want to ask you about that a little bit. Uh, over 200,000 words were generated and the total cost $53. Uh, so $53, not including your time. That's actually just the, the cost to generate, right? So how many hours was this? Correct. Yeah, so it probably took about it took about 15 hours. Um in it, it actually it probably took it took kind of four day, a four day period, but probably took 15 hours of my time. Uh, but I was I kept hitting a lot of failures with the API. It's you know, chat GDP is massively overwhelmed at the moment, um, which kind of set back a bit, but probably 15 hours in total, and then the, the $53 charge was for text generation, which actually is quite minimal, the image generation is the is where the bulk of the of the cost is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about the the website side? So, you it, it's one thing to generate all the content; it's another to actually get it into a hosted website. Did, was that included in the fifteen hours to do the layout and and, and set up? Yeah, completely. Yeah. So that so so that is a HTML template. You know, like I have a multi license too. But let's say it's twenty dollars if if you were going to put a number on it, um, and that fifteen hour, probably of that fifteen hours, let's say three or four of them were um, actually putting the website together, and most of it was just this is the first time playing around with this technology, getting it all linked together, um, and probably five hours of it was generating the content. Yeah, exactly, and and, so, and and some of that is doing the prompt, but some of it's waiting for it to come back, and then. I guess putting it into a document or something that you're a database where you can automatically grab it for the website, correct? 
Correct. Yeah. So so basically behind it's, it's not a complicated website. It's not anything uh, technically that fancy. Um, there's you know for the articles there's two and a half thousand backing files with just very simple markup in it. And then on the images side, it's just generating. The, the images are the main ones because they take time. Um, you know, the text goes away, comes back in a few seconds, um, but the images would fail. Even with, I had a parallel system going, so it would basically run off and do five at once. Um, and then I was hitting rate limits, which I thought was open AI basically limiting me, but actually it was, it was purely an overwhelmed usage of the system in general. Oh, I see. And so which tools did you use? You mentioned OpenAI. So what did you use for text yeah. generation? What did you use for image generation? So text generation is uh, ChatGTP, 3.5 Turbo. Um, and then image generation is DALI. Um, nothing, no fine tuning, no nothing, no weightings or anything, just very simplistic prompts. Um, and then one thing at the beginning was it was, you couldn't, because you have the token limits, um, I couldn't get a list of all the cities. So the 237 cities are actually the capital cities of every country in the world. Um, but I couldn't, I wanted to generate them, which I couldn't. So I had to get them from uh, Wikipedia um, to then feed that into the model to be able to do the, to be able to do the um, generation of the text and the images. And did you write a script so that it would automatically enter all of these 237 prompts yeah. into ChatGTP. Yeah, so it, to be honest, the, I think probably what was the surprising thing is the prompt is very simple and all that changes is a token replacement of the city, comma, country. Mm -hmm. It's nothing It's nothing more. Every, and I think the prompt is uh, give me a list of 10 activities that are family-friendly in city slash country. Uh, but the key was... Um, but return it in a JSON format with, with these fields mm -hmm. because then that enabled, because the problem with ChatGDP, if you communicate with it through the interface, is you get all this gump, which is trying to make it very human and personal, which you know then you have to strip out and everything. But the I don't know for the audience, but for me, I was quite surprised by how well you could then format the response back in JSON and then use that directly in your own site. And, and were the responses consistent in terms of yeah. the formatting? Almost a hundred percent. The only the thing, the only thing was uh, the date. The we can it, for the reviews, which were also generated. Um, the it, the timestamp. So basically, I for the reviews, I basically said, um, generate me a name, review text, and a posted date within the next thirty days of today. Um, and and the, then that would that would come back as some strange kind of responses. But apart from that, everything else was. Uh, concerningly and amazingly uh, correct, considering how small the prompt was, it wasn't much refining on the prompt. It was uh, purely API. What was the concerning part about it? How easy it was. How much inference has been taken from asking for, you know, top 10, 10 family activities in a capital city, which, you know, it sounds obvious, um, but, you know, in, in the blog post, I make a reference to how when we went to, like we traveled to the end of the pandemic, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of TripAdvisor reviews about um, South Korea in particular. We visited um, at the end of our travels. The first three pages of TripAdvisor doesn't mention anything for kids. You know, right. the first result on ChatGTP is the child, is, and it's not even like it's a strange name. It's the Seoul Children's Museum. You know, <laughs> it's kind of an obvious one. Yes. Um, and, I, and I think that was the surprise that actually it, would, it was giving more valuable results than a content site that's been around for, you know, 10 years. Yeah, it's it, really interesting. And I want to come back to reviews, but we'll show. So uh, this is an example of the homepage. And so I think one of the things about this, which is really interesting, is you recreated TripAdvisor. And this is a demonstration product. Uh, or yeah. Obviously, you spent 15 hours on it, $53. TripAdvisor has spent a lot more than that building up content over the years. Uh, but I look at this and... Okay, fine. We could play with the layout, maybe you know, make it more enticing the way you click through. But this isn't unusual. This is probably the type of layout I would normally see. I'd see maybe a, a fancier banner or something at the top. Um, maybe I'd see ads everywhere. Uh, but of and this is what you see. You get a thumbnail. You get a, a a header, which is the place. You get a short description, and then you click through, and then you and you get the 
you get the the detail. Yeah, I, I think, and you know, it was an experiment. It was basically just a, you know, you see a lot of these um, examples of using ChatGTP in this technology in the recent months, um, but they always just do like one article. You know, they don't they don't create two and a half thousand articles um, to really demonstrate the scale of which you can. You know, I think that was the main thing is just to show like, look, this isn't pretty. But if I give this to a designer for three days, it will be indistinguishable, not necessarily from TripAdvisor, but from a competitor to TripAdvisor. You know, for, and therefore, in total, for say less than a thousand dollars, I have now a family-friendly content site which I can monetize in whatever way. Um, you know, competing with you know one of the one of the, if not the biggest, you know, in in the in the Western kind of hemisphere. Yeah, exactly. And so here's here's an example of one of the entries. And so you've got the data here, March 26, 2023. I think that's the day that this was probably, you, yeah. you were on that. Uh, it has the headline, it has a nice image, has the headline, has a sh short description, which I assume feeds into what you see on the first page. And then it just starts going through and starts talking about the Louvre and Abu Dhabi. It's yeah, and, and you know, the, the Louvre and Abu Dhabi is down the road from where I live. You know, it's the, the text is, the text on all of the activities from all the places we visited, we did some spot checks and we, we ran it through, obviously, some um, open AI is pretty good on profanity and, and inappropriate things, but we did a, I did a couple of checks. But the text is pretty spot on and the images even so, you know, they're less so. But like that is a good representation of the Louvre. It's not perfect by any means, but, you know, if you were if you rocked up to the Louvre, you'd be like, OK, this this looks similar. You know, some some of the other images definitely do not have the same level of quality, um, but uh, but no, it's, the text in particular is is probably the thing I was most blown away by. Well, that's one of the things I want to ask you about was okay editing. So in this case, you did spot checks, so you didn't actually read all two hundred thirty seven words. That would have expanded your fifteen hours a little bit, probably from an editing standpoint. But something maybe you could get to later. Uh, <clears throat> when you looked at the when we started doing the editing. What were the, the key things that when you were doing the spot check, were there, was it pr predominantly things that were hallucinations, false information? Was it inappropriate content? Was it, was the grammar off? Was the formatting maybe not consistent? No, uh, the, surprisingly, the formatting was spot on and everything was paragraphs where you would expect it to be. Um, hallucinations and um, fact checking I didn't even bother because I haven't been to Addis Ababa to know if that you know activity is is legit, and and, and that's why the whole thing is plastered with this is an experiment, this is AI generated. the The main thing was um, profanity, and also I had a you know I had a good feeling that I shared it with some friends who were teachers. They were going to show it to their kids in class, um, and just wanted to make sure there was nothing in there that um, you know, would kind of be uh, seen as offensive or misconstrued to a more of a younger audience. So there was profanity, though? There was no profanity, but there was a couple of, um, and again, personal preference, questionable, I guess, descriptions of things in, act in particular activities. Okay, got it. And did you, were you able to do like a search and replace type of concept? Pr pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't anything more advanced than that. Just, you know, searching for the obvious profanity keywords and then and then normally they would lead on to uh, they would you know you would you would search for certain words and they would give you an indication of other bits and then you know you read the power you read the sentence you go okay i'll just take this line out um okay but nothing so that wasn't nothing that from what i saw by you know i didn't go through the quarter of a million yeah. words but there was nothing in there that was um uh cra crazily like it was down to interpretation because the intended audience Mm -hmm. You would have kept it in if it was TripAdvisor. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and actually, if you're actually building this, you just have someone go through and read everything, and uh, you do the you do the automated search, you know, for sort of big issues, things you want to automate. Uh, that might direct people to what to look at, but then they could just read everything. I mean, if, like that wouldn't be unreasonable to do that at some point. An editor would do that in, in most of these types of things, unless maybe your your BuzzFeed and you're using AI to generate your your clickbait. Um, uh, travel recommendations from your sales department. Um, so, you know, along those lines, I did want to ask about the reviews. It sounds like you auto-generated the reviews and, and tell me about the yeah. problems associated with that. So, 
so first of all, I was like, let's just generate like seven reviews for every activity to, uh, and with mixed sentiment. So that was the, you know, to give a very thing. <clears throat> but then I thought, oh, like, people might then get really offended. Like, because at the end of the day, this, now, this is now online. So like Google yeah. can start indexing this. You know, I haven't put a no robot on it yet or anything. Yes. Um, so I didn't want to get like a miss, you know, misconception. So then I tweaked it and was like, okay, well, you can't, you wouldn't be upset if all the reviews were positive. Yeah. So I just set it to positive reviews and then it would basically generate a name. Um, it would generate uh, the review uh, and then obviously the, the timestamp, but that, that wasn't hundred um, percent. But that started take, that was, you know, seven reviews for every city, for every activity in every city. Like that was taking a long time. So I basically just capped it at 400, picked a random subset of the activities. Um, but again, it was, you know, crazily like i don't know if the review obviously the reviews aren't real of that place but like if you read it you would believe it and and it kind of opens up this more larger question of you know you look at TripAdvisor and you you trust that them they are real reviews first of all which you know they may not be but also like even if they are real what real relevance are they to you as an individual like your personal preferences compared to someone else's are you know could be completely different and what they think a cold pool is versus what you think a cold pool is um, so it does make you think, actually, is an AI-generated review really that bad if it's generating it from the internet, you know? Oh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of get rich quick people on YouTube, which will take that and run with that, that rationalization, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. The, uh, so this is interesting, too, because there is a certain style in reviews, and there's also a certain style in articles. And this is one of the, the critiques about BuzzFeed, if people don't know, they they were using AI to just augment their reporters. But then more recently they decided that, oh, AI could just write a bunch of travel reviews for them based on things that their non-journalists had at, thought that might be interesting to put in there. And someone did an analysis of it, which was just hilarious. And they basically showed like how, how frequently certain types of phrases showed up. And it, and it really just comes back to that idea that when people are writing about whether they're reviews or they're writing stories about uh, travel destinations, points of interest, there is a formula that seems to be very common. And did you find that? Did you find that there was a variety or did it, that when you spot check those, that they started all look the same? Like I don't normally post a review, but I had such an amazing experience, dot, dot, dot. C completely. The, the reviews definitely had, you could see that you, you would be like, okay, is this the same troll that's done these five different reviews? You definitely got that feeling. Um, but also, I think even with the articles as well, it, it's you know you start to see the more you more you use you know ChatGPT in everyday life as well as on something of this scale, that you know you have to really fine tune the prompts to get a much broader um, uh, depth of of language. Um, and if you just go with the default, it definitely does follow a formula. Um, but you know, which then equally it comes down to, but what's the purpose of the article? Is it to highlight to the person that the opening times of the Louvre and what the art is? Then, you know, does it does it really matter? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, and the one last thing, just on reviews, which I think is interesting, is so we didn't mention this, you didn't mention this, but I will. The AI might be generating what we would say is fake reviews, but what percentage of reviews on travel sites are fake reviews anyway? Now they may have been authored by a human, but they are not based in anybody's real world experience. You can tell by the way they're written. They sound like this fan fiction type of scenario that people think will draw you in. C completely. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and I think it just opens up the wider thing of like, you know, what is, um, I'm sure we can, we can get to it um, in more detail on, um, on some of the other stuff, but it makes you kind of question like, what is, like a review is just you trying to get by, uh, confirmation for your own opinion. You know, I really like this hotel. Please tell me there's nothing bad to read. Um, but actually, if like it would be an interesting experiment for people to go to hotels not looking at the reviews, do they have a better time because they have no pre notion of of what they think it might be like? Right. You know, exactly. when we when, when we when we traveled, like the there was no reviews. Like no one had traveled for two years. We would go to hotels and. You know, rest, restaurants weren't even didn't exist anymore. So we turn up to this place and it wouldn't be there. 
Um, but then equally, the hotels would beg us to leave reviews, even after, after we complained and left early. They'd be like, but can you leave us a review? Because they just wanted tourists to know that the country was open. And the people had been there, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, really interesting. Um, okay, so what we want to do is I actually, so this has been great on TripAdvisor, the TripAdvisor like example. I like that. Uh, but you did this other project with your daughter that I want to talk about a little bit too, because again, another generative AI uh, project, and I think we will call it the Mr. Lee Hotel Collection because that's what you call it. Could you give us some background on this as well? Yeah. So, um, uh, so, for some, so first of all, some context. Um, whenever we would travel, we traveled mainly in Asia. In a passport in Asia, your first name is in the place of your surname. So I, my first name is Lee, and therefore I just got called Mr. Lee all the time because then we try and pronounce my surname and couldn't do it. Um, and it became a bit of a standing joke with, with my family. And, um, and basically what happened is, as I kind of said in the intro, is, you know, we've been reminiscing over our travels um, uh, quite a bit. And, um, you know, me and my daughter, have been playing, she's really into mid-journey um, for generating characters for stories and just using it as a way to kind of express her creativity. Um, and we were talking about like what's our favorite hotel, and and then we, you know, I started thinking like what what would be my favorite hotel? What would it look like? What would it have? Um, and uh, um, you know, we we basically designed this first one, this first image, which was a, a um, was actually a hotel room with like a Big Ben clock in it, and it, you know, it was it was terrible, but equally um, very photorealistic. Um, and then we just went on to this whole direction as you can see here where we then started thinking about hotels in volcanoes and um space and the water and jungles and um and it became um you know we started with the images and then we just tweaked the prompts and without again much effort um generated some absolutely beautiful photography yeah amazing so like this idea too that i'm interested the the image that i'm showing for the people who are just listening is you've got this picture of some sort of volcano setting and you've got people laying out like it's a spa and it's called a spa too hot to handle. And so I'm interested as well as this fusing, what came first? Did the text come first or did the image come first or was it maybe a little bit of both and you would, you'd see this amazing image and say, Oh, we need to start with the over with the text. Yeah, no, every single one was image first. Um, the only thing is when we, we, so in the, in the kind of collection, there's five hotels, um, when we got to the last one, we were, you know, obviously we'd, we were getting a bit kind of, uh, you know, once you've done like a, 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 a swim pool and a water park and a spa and a restaurant, we started running out of ideas. So we did then start to use ChatGDP to do a bit of kind of aid idea kind of uh, generation, but everything was image first. Um, and then the text kind of came afterwards. Um, but it was, um, and then obviously, and currently the layout um, and the structure was all, you know, us pesky humans uh, adding some element of contribution to it. Um, but everything else is completely generated. And it was, you know, it's, I, you know, I'm actually um, trying to um, get it created into like a coffee book, you know, to have like a, as a physical book, um, just because the images are so nice. And it's nice to have that as a thing that we did together and um, as kind of a sentimental thing. Um, yeah, well, first of all, the images are stunning. And so if everyone who's just listening to the podcast, you might just go over to the voice by YouTube channel and, and check it out because we do, we do share this in the video for those watching the video, obviously you're, you're, you've just seen those, uh, mid journeys amazing like that. Uh, I, I love the different ideas that you guys came up with. Now let's talk about the, the you were using chat for the text generation, uh, and you were using, uh, Mid journey for all the images, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the other one you did use ChatGTP Turbo. Now, in this case, were you using just like plain vanilla ChatGTP or were you using your API access by you know going right to the Turbo model? No, no, uh, complete uh, through the interface, no API, just copy and paste. Because um, it was you know small paragraphs, it was not a scale thing. The brochure is like 27 pages, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but also the, um, the I think the main thing there was that the like there was no intention to create a brochure. You know, we just we were playing around with some photos, um, and then it just kind of evolved into this um, into you know creating some stuff in a volcano, and then 
in space and <clears throat> or in the desert. And then and then we were just like, you know, taking them images and then writing a one, two liner for it, feeding that into ChatGP, describing the hotel. So we weren't saying write a thing about this. We were describing what we'd created. And then we were saying, can you expand on this? Yeah, it's it's kind of like an outpainting feature, right? So mm, completely. It, for text image, we have these outpainting features where you have a you have an image and then you say outpaint and it creates something outside of the, the base image. In this case, you have an idea, and that's really what the AI writing assistants are particularly good at, is you know taking this idea and then expanding it, and, and often in ways that you didn't expect. Uh, completely, and I, and I think that you know, for the TripAdvisor project, we use Dolly because Dolly produces more kind of I guess sensible like Wikipedia, you know, kind of tolerance level images. Um, so if you wanted to do pictures of cities and things, it's going to give you actually something quite close to the to the original. Um, Mid journey, like I know it's stable diffusion under the hood, but there is some fine tuning on that. Like it can go really out there on what it creates, um, but it adds that sci-fi flair to it. Um, and you can produce some stuff that you know your description of a prompt and what you think it would be. Like I remember doing a prompt which was um, a boy in a, a water park in a dome, which to me is you know the child is at the water park and they're in you know it's a dome. But, it, but the picture was a kid holding like a snow globe with a water park inside it, you know, and 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 that, you know, is quite a simple thing, but it just, you know, makes you rethink like, okay, the word, you know, language and words really do make a, an important thing in, in order and preference. And, you know, it, it was, it was, it was quite a, an eye opening thing to further understand language. And then off the back of creating these images, um, the text kind of, you know, the, the 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 small paragraph we wrote to then expand on kind of wrote itself because you're just describing what you see yes. and then also what you kind of feel uh-huh you know like w when we would when we got to the last one so the last uh, hotel is like an eco like a bali indonesia eco retreat mm -hmm. um but it was you know our prompts into chat gp because we were a bit tired by this point were like what's the thing that an eco retreat would have and it you know gave the obvious stuff spa we were like okay Give us some suggestions of a spa, but incorporate like biomedicine and DNA rewriting. You know, like we kind of went out there and it then produced this like, okay, it's a spa, which is a catalyst, butterfly kind of goo generate, like, you know, and it just went into this whole kind of thing. And it was, um, you know, and, they, and, then the, and then that text then made us redo some of the images a bit. And, you know, it just kind of came into this whole um, universe of existence of this hotel. Uh, which was, you know, mind blowing, really. I love this. I just published a, a video with uh, Giannis, um, the CEO of uh, Altered AI. And he and I love to talk about this concept of hyper creation. So everyone thinks about generative AI being this hyper automation. And I think your TripAdvisor um, recreation is a perfect example of that. You basically have something very simple and you say, just create this and you can create it much faster than a human ever could. But then there's this idea of hyper creation, which he talks about in terms of, or defines it really nicely in terms of basically automating uh, the ideation process, thinking about mm -hmm. if you know what you want to do, like TripAdvisor, that's just automation. You just ask the machine to do it and it does it. But then you have this other concept, we don't know what you want to come out of it yet. And you use that to generate new ideas or samples and then lead to additional ideas. And so generative AI, you know, one of the amazing things about it is it does do this hyper creation because it gives you so many options or gives you options like that snow globe or, you know, some of the things you were looking at in the, the volcano that might never have come up, but then all of a sudden you use that and then you can build on it. Yeah. Like in the volcano one, there's an image, which is a uh, four, four plates of food. And the prompt was basically what I was trying to get. I was trying to get like a slate of volcanic rock and then have the food on top. But actually, the images that get created are volcanic, like crumbs, which is a part of the food, you know. And it, and it, like you said, it just kind of makes you. I, don't know, I think it just is kind of like a, you know, why I'd imagine like a psychedelic trip might be, you know, like it's just kind of really expanding your mind as to, you know, um, thinking things a little bit outside the box. Which I is, guess they, you know, I, which, I guess I they mean, should put a chocolate chocolate lava cake, you know, in the middle of that plate for that for that true. restaurant. That would have been uh, that would have been what a human would have thought of for sure. Um, so 
I really love this. What did you do? What did you use for layout? Uh, the human touch. No, no, but what's so, what tool to build your? Uh, oh, ca uh, Canva. Of course, Canva, which is precisely what Andrew, Eric, and I did uh, three months ago, where we said, could we create a cookbook in one hour using generative AI? And so we did the same thing. Yeah. We basically took 10 minutes and we said, okay, what do we need? We're going to do an appetizer, a main dish, and a dessert. And then we said, okay, what does every cookbook need? Well, it needs images of the food. It needs a story about why this is reminds you of your grandmother or something important. Yeah. And then it needs the actual recipe. And then we all went off for 20 minutes with different ass assignments, assembled these different things. We spent five minutes deciding which of the outputs were the best. And then we went to Canva and just laid it out really quickly and made a cookbook with a full meal in just an hour. And then uh, Emerson Sklar, who a lot of people will know, actually went ahead and used the cookbook and made the meal. And he said it wasn't that oh, bad. He said one of the things he thought was very good, two of the things were average. I, I, I told people, I don't know if these recipes are any good. I did not validate them at all. This is AI generated. Uh, the pictures that we have may not match very closely what you come out with, but uh, this is what, you know, in that case, ChatGTP or one of the other tools will give you. Yeah, and I, and obviously Canva last week released quite a, a suite of, yes. you know, AI generative power tools. Um, so I think that having that stuff, more, I, I play around with them, the, the, you know, it's, it's version one, um, but you can see how, um, you know, that's just going to be directly in there. It's interesting now when, um, when, uh, when I wrote the blog post um, for the TripAdvisor project, you'll notice at the top was an image of um, like a travel image of a boat on a, of a, on a, on a river, which is actually from Unsplashed. Okay. You know, from a human, who would have thought? Um, because I couldn't actually generate the image I wanted to for that, for that top bit. Anytime I put travel in or like it was just generating maps, or you know, cartography. Like it was, it was, uh, it was quite interesting that there was a need for the human side of things. Um, but then when we um, did the hotel um, brochure and we were looking at you know, um, like a logo or a supplement video, like we looked at the human stuff on us splashed, and it felt very um, like old fashioned to be looking at, you know, a curation of images rather than generating images. Yes, yes. Uh, and this is why one of the first things I've seen a lot of people use in the creative space is they use the generative AI, the text to image generative AI for uh, mood boards, <clears throat> just yeah. to get ideas and to move things forward or to rapidly prototype. Okay, so so that's been fun talking about that. So you spent seven hours, I think, creating that brochure. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, yeah. No, like, it was basically like a, a day, a daytime. Yeah. And and then the the cost of that was nominal. It was like, a, a, well, it was, with, yeah, I guess it's like $20 a month for, for mid journey. Yeah, exactly. You know, and just fit with ChatGP is exactly. Um, but I think the, um, but again, the majority of that time was waiting for the images. You know, if it was, <laughs> if it was faster then, um, I, and I think I, probably in that, in that doc, in that 27 page document, maybe there's, I don't know, 50, 60 images, but I think we created like 400. Oh, great. Um, great point. Great point. And so did you find too, let's talk about this because we're going to talk about prompting in just a moment. Uh, did you find too that uh, like you really had to spend a lot of time to get the image that you wanted? Maybe you got like every once in a while you got this amazing thing and it was just perfect. You run with it. But most of the time it was like, oh, that's kind of garbage. How can I get something better? Yeah, I would say it, it netted on the side of the, um, when you put the word futuristic in front of your prompts, like the quality seems to go up. You know, um, but but the thing that was uh, there was two the two two kind of biggest outcomes on that from it was the first one. So if you're not familiar with Mid Journey, you it's through Discord as a chat interface. You basically put your prompt in, and it will return back to you four images. Um, you can then upscale or create a variance of any of them images. So there was one image which is the first one you showed of the bedroom and the volcano, and the wall was actually smooth, but the uh, that's around the window. When you upscale the image, that's what then got created. And I was quite surprised that I didn't realize, and I think this is something that maybe most people don't know, is that when you upscale an image, or you're, it's, not, it's not upscaling the existing image, it's regenerating um, the prompt with you know, a reference to that, but it's actually a completely new image, um, which, was, which was quite surprising. We found that quite a lot where 
you would uh, upscale a photo and you'd get more details or things would move. And oh, it right. wouldn't be yes. quite as obvious. Uh, and then the second bit was once we kind of got the, like a style for the hotel and then further in that section, you wanted to create a picture of, you know, a, a hotel room or of a restaurant, trying to replicate the same again um, was very difficult until you start to get to understand the, the, the kind of the under the hood stuff. So within mid journey, you can supply an image as a reference point and right. then a prompt. So we started supplying that. Um, and then also you can do things where, um, you can set a seed value to try and basically replicate, uh, a similar style, right. um, which was, which was, um, again, you know, kind of opened up that thing of, okay, you can actually, uh, you can get a bit of rep, uh, predictability on, on this stuff, yes. um, which I think has been the, the nuance to this stuff of people kind of saying it's not going to take over design roles because, you know, you could do one prompt and it could create two different things. But I think in the next kind of year, we're going to see some dramatic uh, improvements there. Yeah, nice pro tip for people who haven't spent a lot of time with the text image generators. Using seeds can really, really change uh, your productivity and, and, and how you can create more coherence across a particular set. All right, so let's let's move on. You've been in the voice assistant space for a number of years. And one of the things that's sort of obvious to everybody who's been in the voice assistant space, and I think a lot of a lot of other people as well, let's let's be fair, open AI calls ChatGTP an assistant. You know, that's their internal <laughs> their internal name for it. Um, so what we're talking about here is that it aside from being able to generate all of these things is like creative projects, which I think the first two things we talked about were creative projects. We also have this opportunity to use these same tools that are coming out of the generative, generative AI industry to significantly transform how virtual assistants work. Yeah, well, I think the expectation is now there. You know, we had, you know, uh, Echo and I'm, I'm, I'm wary to say the words because things will start talking to me. Yes. Um, but we had all these uh, home assistants and you know, when they first came out, they were revolutionary, the idea that you could play and stop music. And then we, we became accustomed to it. You know, we just expected it the same way that, you know, no one gets up to press the button on their TV. They use their remote control. It just becomes, you know, default behavior. And, you know, the last few years, I'm sure you would agree, Brett, like we had the nuclear winter, you know, within, within the space. We, you know, get into intense, like what was the thing after intense, you know, to be able to not have to generate thousands upon thousands of different, pattern matching, uh, training kind of, um, uh, prompts, arguably and LLMs, I think have just created this new, uh, potential generation of, of what assistance can be. Um, and it's interesting to see when, you know, the Amazons of the world and Apple embrace them and see what their things are going to turn into. Yeah. I wonder if they are going to embrace them. I, eventually they'll be forced to, but I don't know how long they're going to hold off. I mean, we're not, we're not hearing from Google, they've got other problems, but we're not hearing from Google that, you know, Palm is gonna be driving Google Assistant in the future. Uh, Amazon, and if people don't know, has had a generative AI text-to-text -text model for a long time. They just only used it for internal purposes. Um, and one product that they put out last year, I think there's a couple other things that they've experimented with with it, uh, but they haven't thought about changing the core Alexa architecture, maybe they've thought about it, but they haven't done anything or shown anything like that. Siri, who knows what they're doing with that? Because generally they're, they're not doing anything with it. Uh, you know, what, do, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I look at ChatGTP, it passed the Alexa price uh, criteria the day it rolled out. Uh, no team has gotten closer than, you know, 12 minutes of the 20, uh, I think, yeah. uh, in, in terms of meeting Alexa prize criteria for using Alexa or modified Alexa type solutions. And they certainly haven't gotten the four to five star rating, which ChatGPT does, which people are thrilled with and they'll talk to it for hours. What's next? What, what's going on here? What do we need to think about in terms of this step change? Um, I think if, if the world wasn't falling apart economically, I think potentially we would have had that evolution. You know, the, the big tech companies are, you know, layoffs everywhere. Teams are being disbanded. So they can kind of in, either intentionally or unintentionally buy some time to not 
drive these things forward. You know, Google Assistant is already, you know, in an, another three weeks is first part, first, uh, first party only, you know. So, um, but I do wonder what happens when Apple's headset comes out. You mean the the AR visor? Mm. Like what will be, you know, if you imagine Siri is the the interface for control of that, it's going to be a little bit, it's not going to have the same effect as it potentially would have pre-November last year. Well, I, I actually if, just don't think that they would have done anything, uh, frankly. I mean, that's maybe that's a cynical view. I don't think that the personnel is the issue. I think it's uh, sunk cost or, you know, you know which we, we, we might call engineering debt at this point in some ways. But I also think it's this issue of control. Uh, and this is the, one of the big problems Google has right now is they're, they've been so resistant to do anything where they don't have complete control or even like a higher standard than what they have for their other solutions, which, don't, which aren't complete control, but at least are procedural uh, mostly with some stochastic tools behind them. But um, I think they would have been very hesitant to do anything where they didn't have control. And actually something like ChatGPT Chat might give them the permission now to do that. Now they're resource constrained. And so it's going to be harder for them to catch up. And it's almost like uh, Sundar Pichai has said this publicly, but I, I remember talking to him briefly when I was at Google I.O. a few years ago. And he's basically said, you know, we could not, Google could not have been the first company to put a always listening device into a home. Like the no consumer, yeah. no media, no government would have felt comfortable with that. But you know, essentially, he didn't say this, but I'm paraphrasing. Once Amazon normalized the situation, then it was okay for us to do this. And I think that having an LLM-driven solution, which might have errors, like everything has errors. Procedural systems in NLU also have errors. They just happen to be usually human commission. Uh, that they would have had too much scrutiny that they wouldn't have been able to do this. But now with ChatGTP and with all the things that are going to come out, which are their new competitors, I think they have permission to do it. In fact, they're going to be forced to do it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree that they will too. I think it's just now the speed. You know, Microsoft would fall into the same camp. OpenAI is, you know, pseudo Microsoft now. Um, but they were able to you know, venture down the path with its original ambition to be open and democratizing AI. And then slowly but surely capitalism found its way. Um, and, you know, everyone forgets that, you know, that's now a Microsoft based company for all intents and purposes. Yeah. Um, and I do, you know, I think there's also a thing of like, we, there's a, there's an, the expectation from, because in the buildup of ChatGDP, getting the mainstream press attention it got, we had all of the stuff around sentience and engineers being worried things were going to take over the world and Skynet and all this type of stuff. Um, but I think actually, you know, people aren't necessarily looking for ChatGDP to be the, the Google of knowledge. You know, it just so happens it was. You know, if they had to go to one tool to write a resignation letter and another tool to write some code, I think people would be on board with that. So I think actually when a, if it is an Apple headset or if it's a iPhone 27, whatever it may be, um, having some LLM kind of uh, feeling around it in the conversation pattern, that's going to be A, expected, but also can be controlled within the narrative of it's on your phone. It, it's in this vertical of information about you on the device. Um, and I think it's just going to, you know, they've kind of, OpenAI have kind of set precedent of what is going to be expected from a consumer point of view now. Well, and what they did is they, not only have they given permission for the big tech companies, but they've given for permission for consumers to say, oh yes, I like this despite certain flaws. And I, and I, you have used this analogy before, but like, you know, I've used it a lot of different places over the years. When mobile phones came first came out, not smartphones, mobile phones, uh, it was transformational. And I happened to be working with AT&T at the time on a strategy project because I was a consultant at that time. And they just kept telling me about quality of service, quality of service, mobile phones. is just terrible. Like they drop and you can't hear people. Like people will never like give up their landline. You know, and obviously that looks ridiculous. And in retrospect, it it didn't look that ridiculous then because they were living under a paradigm 
where they followed what people wanted and what people wanted was higher quality and all these things. But once you add something new to the mix, all of a sudden priorities change. And the fact that I could take a phone call on my way home from work that was related to work, but maybe, you know, save what would have been an extra 45 minutes in traffic or something like that, that was really meaningful to me as a user. And there were so many other reasons. And it's like, I remember Nokia's chairman at the time had said, this was the late 90s, said, you don't understand how revolutionary mobile is to like a bunch of reporters. He said, up until this point in time, you've called a place to reach a person. Now you just call the person. And then, and when you start to think about that, like everything else becomes possible. And I think with ChatGTP, it's like people will use it for search, knowing that there are things that are wrong. They don't care yeah. because it might approximate or might get them closer to something that they could not have before because it's new. And then when you know you bring out new Bing and you've got perplexity AI and all these things that tie together retrieval models, which give you the LLM capabilities plus the assurance of something that is more deterministic, not completely, but closer and reduces hallucination issues, then all of a sudden they're like, oh, this is just an amazing transformation. My expectations have immediately been reset. But I think also though, your the, the argument is making the assumption that if you search conventionally, you're finding the truth, which you're not. Exactly. You know, so, you're actually, so actually, actually you're not finding anything. They're they're giving you their best guess at where you can then do more exploration. They're not giving you an answer typically. Yeah, I, I find myself now. Um, I'll be on my phone and I'll you know want to search for something or come up with something. I'll go to I'll type in chat dot. It'll come up as auto complete. I'll then forget I've logged out or it's timed out. I'll then log in. The interface on my phone is rubbish. I'll then type my prompt, wait for the response versus just going to Google and searching. Like, <laughs> or just, you know, or just it's, pushing it's, the side button and like getting it, like speaking it and getting it almost instantly. It, it, it's, it's, uh, but I think it's that conditioning of, like you said, that there's, I think the biggest thing is the state, the state management, you know, the, the fact that you have this conversational scope to build upon your query, um, which, which search doesn't have, and in theory kind of can't have because of the, the monetization model for, um, execution to, for ads and stuff. So um, it does kind of, um, it, I think where we move more to, when you look at stuff like the TripAdvisor project, you know, is it bad if all content is generated in the future? You know, or argue, could you argue it already is? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, I think this idea that everything's derivative uh, and everyone's referencing something else is largely true. I mean, that there are occasionally, very occasionally, something unique pops up, uh, but you know, not very often. And I think, well, let's transition to this because I want to talk about this one last thing before you know, our time expires today. But you've been thinking about this idea of what the next evolution of an assistant looks like. And it's based on these ideas of prompt personalization and, and doing things that the voice assistants never got us to because they weren't actually remembering who you were across sessions very well or at all, usually. And it was almost like that search experience that you start fresh every time. So it's utility. It can get you music. And maybe that music system knows your preferences. But the assistant itself doesn't know your preferences. Yeah. So the great kind of summary the this particular kind of research project i basically have been doing this on a few projects um in as a consultant and it became a recurring theme which was in a assistant based communication pattern be it voice ivr or chatbot on a website first of all if you're not logged in there's no personalization beyond maybe country ip address language um, if you are logged in, then there's also this element of, you know, does Ikea know my shoe size? Does it need to versus Nike knowing my shoe size? Um, uh, we've gotten used to OAuth and the ability to log in with Apple ID, and then it'll obfuscate your payment details, et cetera, et cetera. I, th I think we're moving now to with, I think the, the large language model phenomenon that's taken over the world at the moment with ChatGDP, um, 
will continue on and all the products that are now adding these AI features create a monumental shift from um, code, coding first, to basically language description first. Um, and, and what I mean by that is when you um, go to a website, um, if, it's, if you're purchasing something, you'll get the nice little padlock and that's like an SSL connection. And what happens behind the scenes is there's a handshake. I pass some codes, you pass some codes, and we then have this secure communication channel. Um, I think what's going to happen next is I'm going to basically tell the website some preferences um, that I have, uh, and then it will communicate with, um, I've kind of coined it as like a digital doppelganger of me, which is my kind of like digital twin. And then there'll be this kind of exchange of conversation, like in natural language. Uh, and what will then happen is the website that I get shown is going to be completely different to the website that you get shown, but also the content on that also is not just, you know, the sorting is different or the products are in a different place. It could be completely generated. Like, so when you, you know, go and search for some night trainers, like the hero image on the homepage could be a completely generated shoe that doesn't exist. And if more than a thousand people decide to tap on that hero image, then the website owner goes, okay, we should probably like, maybe we should make this shoe, for example. Yeah, and I like this idea. So you've got two concepts here. So why don't you just, and we showed a couple images there uh, about how that actually works and the, the idea of the, the digital doppelganger. But what are the two primary concepts and how do you think those are going to manifest? So imagine if you, so you go to a website that has um, a chatbot interface and, and that's normally going to play one or two ways. Either you are talking to a virtual chatbot Q and A knowledge, or you're talking to a human through a chatbot interface. Um, them experiences are painful if it's a human, or if it's a you know you're trying to get to the agent because let's say for example the product you bought has you want to return it and you need to find out how to return or it hasn't turned up. You, you know you're you're basically wanting to speak to someone to resolve a problem. Um, what if when the website loads up? Actually, take a step back. What if I say to my digital doppelganger, um, I haven't had my order, we need to sort this out. It then fires up the website. It then does an exchange of conversation with the chatbot and says, uh, I've got Lee. Uh, he wants to basically find out where his stuff is. Like, we don't need any politeness. Let's just get straight to the point. Um, if you can basically reset, resend it out, um, for a small fee, like he'll just say yes. And you basically have this exchange as the website's loading. So when then, when it does load and the chatbot comes up, it's just it just basically comes up with, we're really sorry, your package will be with you tomorrow. Um, that's kind of like the, the kind of, I guess, using this more AI technology in the traditional Web2 environment. The, the, where I think eventually we'll end up is where I go to a website, say an e-commerce website um, for clothing, uh, and when the website loads, I basically exchange all of my measurements, all of my preferences of brands, of sizes, of colors, of budget, and that whole website is now, um, in some ways, doesn't exist. It basically generates yes. off the back of my uh, preferences, um, and then... You know, as I'm browsing through it, I can make a note to my doppelganger, be it by a prompt, by audio in the background. Oh, that that brown's very nice. Um, and maybe I might say, if I order, you know, as we know with a lot of sites, if I order, I want to order this trainer, um, but I'm not sure what size feet is going to work. So I want to order two sizes. Some sites are going to, you know, yes. charge you for the return, so on. But let's say... You basically tell your Gopagan and say, like, order me these two things if the return price is less than $10. It then goes off. Like, I then leave the website, I go. Yes. It then goes off, has a whole communication method with uh, the system. And only if there's a prompt that requires my human input, be it actually the fee is going to be $12, not $10. Are you cool with that? Or they're out of stock of this size. Do you want to go one up again? Um, and you basically have this agent to agent communication um, through. Uh, through these networks of, of digital doppelgangers, but even more so, I might then 
speak to your digital doppelganger and exchange like the trainer I just bought and how cool and comfortable it was because we run together well, twice a week. Yeah, yeah, for of example. course. Uh, and I think you know this just opens up a whole other um, area of where this stuff's going to go. But also, we don't have the tooling for large language model based digital experiences. So we have to kind of start a bit from step one. Well, okay. So there's, and there's two, the two concepts. It's like that you laid out and there's a video that people can see on your website. We'll show people a link to that in just a moment, but preference prompts. So some way for you to express your preferences to this new type of assistant and the preference exchange protocol, which you know, hopefully would be something that people could all agree on. So then it would make it easier for that machine to machine communication, your digital doppelganger to talk to whatever web services out there that you might be interacting with. And so those are like interesting building blocks. Now, I, I think there's a, there's a bigger shift in people's perspectives that need to take place here or could take place here with what you're proposing. Today, every website wants to create a little assistant for you. Usually that's a chat bot. And some, sometimes those chat bots are only really there to collect your email address. Uh, and, and they have no useful functionality beyond that, uh, which is eternally frustrating. But sometimes they're more sophisticated. It might be a chat bot. Could be an even more sophisticated voice assistant, a voice assistant with an avatar, all these other things. So we're going to, to display this. What you're talking about could make that unnecessary. If we all had our own digital doppelganger or our own assistant, who then could communicate with these digital services via machine to machine language, then we always interface with our assistant and then the, the need for their assistant becomes irrelevant. Yeah, or you could argue that the, if we are thinking language first, you don't need machine to machine. So then it doesn't matter if it's you to your doppelganger, that to another doppelganger, or that to a system, or does it that you know does it implement the protocol or not is irrelevant as long as it can say hi, yes, and conversates in maybe not even the same language. You know, we're just basically saying language is the communication channel, not code. Right. Um, and I think I think for for me, I think that becomes, you know, the. I, I think it's inevitable. It might not be in the in the the, the kind of um, futuristic example I've shown you, where everything kind of automatically yes. starts changing based on preferences. But I think it'll be. It might be even subtler. Whereas you know, it wouldn't be a stretch that you add to your Android or iOS phone some personal preferences, and then when you go to a website, the same way that it pops up and says "log in with Apple ID," yes. that it basically says, "Do you want to share with this shoe website your shoe size automatically?" Uh, yeah, I mean, was, we've been promised mass customization forever, personalization, and really what we have is we have uh, group personalization. We don't have individual personalization in most instances. And what you're describing, though, about this idea of this new type of assistant that can act on your behalf, it just it knows what to negotiate. This is very similar to what we saw with the promise of Google Duplex, whether it actually filled that or not. It goes out into the world, these ideas of assistance with agency and does things for you based on a defined set of preferences. In that case, you were saying, I want a hair appointment or I want a restaurant reservation for this time at this type of place. And it would it had some latitude to make some decisions and interact with humans in that case uh, in order to complete whatever the task is, could come back, ask you a clarifying question, whatever those things might be. Uh, but in, in general, just go do things for you. And sure, that could happen, your assistant to their assistant in natural language. The preference exchange protocol could be a shorthand version of that uh, because basically it just says, hey, we're here for this and fill, uh, you do slot filling essentially you know, from your, your yeah. preferences um, and then it moves faster. But we've got this idea of assistance to go do things for you. We've got this idea of a conversational interface and then how do we make this more efficient? So I, I really love this idea of where you're headed with it because this is the type of thinking that we need to have because we're talking about a new set of assumptions, new set of capabilities. So therefore, the solution model needs to be different. We need to think about it differently. I, and I think the biggest shift there is not, and, and it's and it's a hard one because you're right that the 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 monetization of a digital storefront is either for you to purchase something or for them to extract data about you to sell. You know, um, so that is a big thing that has to therefore change or evolve. 
by new players, you know, who are thinking more, um, you know, and I think this is where like actually uh, tokenization and micropayments and blockchain stuff actually has a potential great use case. Um, but I think the, the biggest shift is what if, you know, Ikea as a company doesn't necessarily have to have like a website to be its digital storefront. It has a large language model fine-tuned to its values and accountancy inside of Ikea has one, marketing yes. has one, sales has one, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's an outlet of a, a term to be de determined, which is uh, a set of uh, objectives and rules for a web presence um, from Ikea's values of what they want to do. And then your digital doppelganger is talking to that. And it just so happens that a part of that inflection point may be a visual, you know, uh, a web portal, but more likely is going to be a push notification for you to say yes or no, because it involves spending money or access to PPI that, you know, you, you just want to um, uh, restrict. Uh, and it does kind of open up the view of like, does that mean that everything becomes uncreative and beautiful and, <laughs> and that type of stuff? But, but I think it, exactly, but because I think then it becomes more, you know, we're human, we love stories, we love the emotive feel of stuff, but maybe that becomes more of the focus. Maybe you can go to the Nike website. They don't have to keep trying to sell you the shoe that's going out of stock because it's 3D printed as you order it. Yeah, of course. You know? Of course. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think the merchandisers will never allow images to go away because they are powerful and what they care about is conversions ultimately. Uh, Lee Mallon, this has been amazing. I really appreciate it. I'll, I'll put up on the screen here. Everyone should go check out uh, blog.leemallon.com. Lee Mallon's L-E-E-M-A-L-L-O-N. I really appreciate uh, you spending some time talking about your project. And it's really just fun to talk with everybody who's in this space, who's doing all these experimentations right now, uh, because we are seeing something that is truly different. I feel like what we saw with Alexa was an interesting evolution and a very significant evolution of what we're doing. But it was almost like that was the evolution of websites to mobile. We were basically turning it into a new paradigm. We were adding new capabilities. And so that led to all these new use cases as well as optimization of old use cases. But when we're moving into generative AI and this AI as a platform more broadly, it's it seems more like this shift from analog to digital to me, that we went from analog yeah. to digital. That was a tremendous transformation. Like it's hard to understand like how far reaching that was. And now we're moving from this idea of a procedural world to a generative world. And it leads to a whole lot of new use cases, but a whole lot of new assumptions. hundred percent. And I agree the the stuff that people are creating every day is, you know, it's hard to, you know, luckily we have people like you, Brett, to kind of give us the snapshot of everything people are working on to be able to digest it. It's moving so fast. Um, but you're right. I, to me, this is like the internet, you know, this is that level of, a uh, step up of where this is going, and I do think, uh, do think it, we are equally also on a bit of a tilting point as to um, I, actually I, uh, to, as a finishing story. So, um, me and my daughter worked on this hotel project, right? Completely fictitious, does, didn't exist. Twenty-seven pages, seven hours of amazing time. Um, I then showed her the TripAdvisor project. She, she wasn't involved in it. And like, she got really angry that I wasted my time creating something fake about real things. And, and it was really one of the things of like, okay, so this is like an interesting kind of perspective of when you're um, like, if it's real, like there's an element of manipulation or interpretation versus something that's just purely creative. And it makes me wonder now going forward, what if everything is just created. You know, like everything is just, as you interact with it, it you know, we lose in some ways, the, not necessarily the value of imagery and video and text, but it, it has a fleeting moment. Like you go to a website, an image exists for two seconds and then it never exists again. Um, I think that can go one or two ways. Hopefully it goes for the, for the better. Well, that's a really great point. I will say that that's, 
kind of like words in a podcast, although this is recording. If this were live and we didn't record it, it would be fleeting like that. It would just be off in the ether. Uh, but it's a really fascinating point. That's going to require a lot more thought. It's a great way to characterize how different this world might be. Lee Mellon, thanks so much for joining me today. This has been really fun. And I think we should have you back after your next project. Definitely. Cheers, Brett. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.